Today's episode of the podcast is brought to you by Coach Me Plus. Coach Me Plus is the leader in athlete management software and a product that we've been lucky enough to implement here for over two years now. The product in and of itself is exactly what you need it to be, guys, with options ranging from being a workout provider, as in sending the workout directly to the student athlete's phones, to being a place where you can communicate with them and bring together multiple streams of data to be its own dashboard for you, your coaching staff, or the athletes. Or you can use what we've added to our our menu of Coach Me Plus activities, and that's Hydration Station, where all of this information that is provided is based off of research from the Corey Stringer Institute, where we're looking at weighing in versus weighing out and then providing optimal hydration uh, strategies for the student athletes by them selecting through the menu and tapping on what they'll take home with them and what they're consuming prior to the next practice um, when all the numbers at the top are lined up green. It's something we've had really good success with and the kids have really bought in on. Just another great example of the awesome product that you can find at coachmeplus.com. Guys, hop over to coachmeplus.com today and check it out. It's a product I guarantee you won't be disappointed with. Hey everybody, if you enjoy the podcast and the content it provides, be sure to hop over and check out the community. The community is an exclusive members website that is just an extension of what we do here in July at the Central Virginia Sport Performance Seminar. What it is is a combination of video lectures, a coach's corner with your Monday morning take-home information, and a forum where you can talk about anything and everything related to the field of strength and conditioning. In the community, you'll find content added each month from some of the top practitioners in the world ranging from PhDs to high-level coaches, bringing you exactly what they're doing with their athletes or their research at the present moment. On top of that, an additional discussion by coaches bringing you that Monday morning information, things that you can add to your training program right away. Tying that in with the opportunity to discuss with coaches around the world in the forum on anything and everything from the topics addressed in these presentations to whatever you're seeing in your daily life as a coach. If this sounds like the right thing for you and your staff, Go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and try it out for 48 hours for just a dollar. If you like it, you're signed up, ready to roll, and you're jumping into all the great content added each month. If not, feel free to go ahead and cancel at any time. No questions asked. We're really excited about what we're building in the community and hope you are too. Go ahead and hop over to cvasps.com slash community and check it out today. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today, guys, we have an awesome discussion with Milad and Jovanovic talking about culture and its impact in sports. Guys, Milad has been all over the world from Europe to the Middle East and then to Australia and the States and, and back over to Europe. And, and he shares with us his voyage and how culture impacts the training and sport culture of each area. Uh, he then gets into, you know, how different sports prepare since he's worked with a vast array of different athletes and his take on training and sports sciences around the world, how they're developing, how they're improving and, and where different regions may be ahead of others in certain aspects. We then get into monitoring and, and how it can be used to, to be smarter and, and also how it can get in the way at times. Uh, he shares some flaws he sees with injury prediction and then he gets into what he's doing now and, and the research he's doing with his PhD. This is a really awesome talk, guys. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Let's get right to it. Laden, thank you so much for being on with us today, man. Thanks a lot. We've been planning for this for like a few months. Oh, yeah. We've been just postponing it. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's, it's been a lot of tennis, man. Back and forth, your court, my court. But I'm, I'm stoked to finally get this, get this recorded and get it rocking and rolling, man. So listen, you have had, you've literally gone from different corners of the world uh, to coach and to work with athletes. And what I think would be a neat thing to talk about is, is your different stops and, and the pros and the cons and the things that made you a better coach and, and what things you've brought back with you to Serbia um, and, and, and roll from there. Uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting question. Um... But be, before I even start, um, um, I have a book to recommend. Uh, it's called A Culture Map. So I wish I read that book before starting this journey. 
because it, it gives you this um, usable knowledge of the cultures differ around the world, not only sporting cultures, but, you know, just culture in general, like how people, um, you know, deal with relationships, with, with critique, with feedback and, and stuff like that. And I wish I wish I had read that book uh, before uh, some some things will be much, much easier, much be more understandable. I couldn't I wouldn't be banging my head against the wall, you know. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, for those who are, you know, listening to me for the first time, uh, I've been in, in, you know, strength coaching in Serbia, mostly soccer. Um, then I've, I've been uh, interning at Mike Ball at Boston in 2010. Uh, then I was in Sweden for two years in soccer as well. Um, then 2000. 14, 15, I was in Qatar with the Aspire Academy as a football physiologist, football as soccer. And 2015, 16, I was in um, um, Port Adelaide with the uh, Port Adelaide Football Club. So it's Aussie rules football, and it's it was a you know a great journey. I'm 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 looking forward to uh, to continue it. So. Um, yeah, there's a there's a big difference between sports and, and cultures. Um, for example, um, you know, working with soccer athletes in, in Serbia is quite difficult because, first of all, um, you know, salaries are the issue. So the money is issue. You know, you don't have facilities. Um, the culture level when it comes to strength conditioning is pretty low. It's getting better, but it's it used to be really, really bad. So, you know, get, getting them to lift, lift heavy, you know, it's quite hard because you don't have equipment. So we usually tend to use a commercial gyms so when i started 2007 we used a commercial gym and that was a you know major uh, pain in the ass pretty much uh, but we managed to equip really really small room inside the stadium and we use that for for you know lifting um, if i showed you this room it would be you know i wouldn't say embarrassing it's nothing you know embarrassing in in, in that it just it will be really eye-opening how small that room is so, uh, but we managed to lift, uh, and we managed to, you know, do something. But, uh, for example, when I moved to Sweden, uh, the, the contrast that hits me is this, is the level of the athletes when it comes to education in general. So they are much more educated, uh, and they are more, and they much more embrace the, you know, strength conditioning. So most of the athletes over there, when I was in Hammarby, they were already familiar with you know, strength lifting, you know, squatting, cleaning, snatching, you know, bench pressing and stuff. So it was quite easy to, to, to work with them. So that, that was a, a major uh, difference, I would say. And then, of course, one of the, you know, major difference is the climate. So we tend to, we, we actually use the threshold of minus 10 degrees Celsius to stop the training. So if, if it's, you know, minus five, and that's below freezing, we still play. So minus 10 was, it's too cold, we are not, we are not training outside. So uh, we, we used to go to an um, indoor pitch, which demanded a little bit of travel across the city, uh, and then we combined it with the outside pitch that, that has a little bit of heating underneath the, the turf. So at least you're, you're a little bit, you know, warm on the, on the foot, but on the feet, sorry. So, uh, yeah, that, you know, and dealing with, with that climate is, is, was a quite difficult, uh, the season, you know, the season there, soccer season was from one chunk. So you have a preseason that, that's quite long and then a long in season where in Serbia we have, we have, um, around six weeks preseason, three months in season, short break. And then we repeat that. So we have like, a two parts uh and it was same in australia so in australia they have uh, when it comes to aussie rules i think they start somewhere in october till if i remember correctly march or april so it's a quite long uh preseason and then in season goes from march till uh, october again so it, it's one big one big in season so 
in terms of culture, I would say, you know, Aussie rules is by far the best. Um, the level of uh, sports science, the level of, um, you know, the, I would say the level of the athletes is outstanding. I was, you know, quite amazed. So that's an amazing place. So it could be Port Adelaide, but it could be also IFL. But, you know, the implementation of and trust in a sports science is, you know, top in the world. Um, when it comes to strength training, same thing. So uh, what um, amazed me from, you know, coming from soccer is that, uh, you know, a number of uh, football practices, or in this case, uh, footy practices, we had like three practices a week. And, you know, coming from soccer, uh, we tend to have, you know, seven or even more practices a week. And uh, a friend of mine, and you're working in a basketball, they have two practices a day for like two hours each. So when it comes to that, the, 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 the sports differ a, a lot. So I would say when it comes to team sports, volleyball is the worst. So they have like two practices a day that can last for like two or three hours each. And then it's the basketball. So basketball is around two practices a day. And then soccer is probably one practice a day, which is, uh, it's really good to work in, in soccer. W what did I say last? Soccer or basketball? So basketball yeah, soccer, before soccer. Yeah. 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 Soccer has one practice a day, uh, soccer practice, and then you can do some extra, extra stuff. So, um, yeah, there's a big difference between cultures, uh, you know, uh, country wise and then also uh, sport wise. So, uh, it's a, it's a good learning experience to, to understand that, you know, uh, if you're working in the same sport, um, in different countries, it could be completely different culture. So, you know, Sweden, that that's cold pretty much whole year, you know, you're going to, you're going to have different soccer culture than, you know, working in say Spain where it's, it's, it's warm pretty much all, all year round. Uh, you know, the warm up needs to be different uh you know stuff like that so i guess i guess i don't know if that answers your question but just just hit me if you if you need something more no specific. totally man and i and i love the fact that you're sitting there breaking down practices and, and what that was like um the part of that that fascinates me to be totally honest is like a lot of people listening to this in the states aren't going to understand footy um but it's crazy. Like the game's wild and it's huge. And these cats are going forever and they're covering so much distance. So I guess my question is when you looked at that and what you guys were doing down in port, how did those three practices, did that open up the door for you guys to do more of the physical prep stuff? Or was the three practices necessary because it, the game's so physical and it's so much work that these guys need that time just to, to get, to, you know, get back from, from competition. I, I think it, it's, it's the physicality of the game that, uh, demands sh lower number of, uh, of practices per week. So you, you, you're probably right in that regard. Uh, but we still had, uh, they tend to switch from season to season. So when I was there, they stopped. They had a little bit of wrestling practices, which, which I wanted to have more, you know, contact practices or, you know, wrestling and throwing and things like that without too much, you know, banging with the full velocity. Uh, so it, it's the physicality of the game, similar to rugby, that doesn't allow you higher frequency of practices. But, you know, similar to rugby, you can still do, uh, you know, tag stuff, uh, or flag football, as you like to call it in the States, right? So using our flags rather than, you know, contact. So, uh, and we still had a lot of, you know, other assistant stuff. So we had a, a lot of extra running. We had a, a lot of lifting. Uh, we had a lot of uh, individual skill work. Uh, they called, they used to call craft. So they had uh, a lot of, each athlete needs to have a lot of, say, a ground balls, maybe 100 ground balls two times a week. Uh, things, a lot of kicking practice as well. So there's a, you know, a lot of footy, but there's not, not a lot of, uh, um, tactical team sessions. Interesting. I like that though. Cause I get those, 
those technical practices, as long as they're kept on, you know, focus, can be recuperative in nature as well, because you're allowed just to kind of zone in on one thing. It shouldn't take that long. You get your one thing in, and then you you get out. Well, I, from my limited experience to, to footy, I'm, I'm mm. probably, I'm by far not an expert in that. So the first time I actually saw a game was, you know, when I spoke to Berger for the first time. I, I was aware, of, you know, of the IFL, uh, and I saw maybe a few clips of the games, but and I read a few articles about it, and most of the interesting sports science stuff comes from IFL. Mm-hmm. So I was aware of the of the sport, but by far I don't have much experience with it. But from my limited experience, um, I see that the sport is going through a transition. So the first, I would say the first phase of that sport was really, you know, rough sport, was a not, not a gentleman game. So it was like a... It, Everybody, you know, the goal of the game is to punch someone in the face, pretty much. So they had a lot of fighting. It was really, really physical. But mm-hmm. physical in terms of, you know, punching someone in the head, pretty much. A lot of, you know, jumping on, on, on head and a lot of bumping and stuff like that. So it was really physical. And then the face, too, pretty much is the running game. So it, it became a running game. So all this stuff, um, you know, the fans and the athletes and the coaches started becoming fascinated with, you know, GPS and how much you run. So they, they look at those numbers and, and judge the performance in, in terms of how much you're running. But uh, similar to soccer, I think soccer passed through that phase. And, and soccer is now becoming a very intelligent game. Um, and I think footy, Australian Football League, is, is going to that progression as well. So the next step will be saying, okay, it doesn't really matter how much you run as long as you are, you know, smart in the game. So I think the next step, and I think they're starting to realize that. So the next phase will be, okay, you know, it's important to run in a game. It's important to be physical, but, you know, you need to be tactically smart. So interaction between the athletes needs to be, you know, top notch. So I think that the paradigm will shift. So coaching will become more, and it's actually becoming quite already, um, it, it's, it's going to become less physical focused and more tactically focused. So similar that's happening in, in soccer. So I think that's a next step. And again, I'm, I'm a complete uh, lay person when it comes to, you know, footy history and, and, and footy. But from my limited ex, you know, exposure to the sport, that's, that's what I see as a, as a sound being involved in multiple sports. So, and that, that's why I think the number of sessions – uh, group session and team session is going to increase, but the you know physicality might might decrease in those sessions. So let's 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 piggyback on that. I think that's pretty cool because I think that a lot of people, I mean, st- you know, GPS is still a pretty sexy thing, and a lot of people still like to look at all that data and those numbers and whatever they may be pulling from it. But when you're talking about smarter and the technical tactical aspect of it, are you referring to those monitoring aspects as well? And if so, how do those fit in? with the, quote, smarter technical tactical aspect in your mind? So one of the analysis I did, and I remember doing it because, uh, because Berger, Berger wanted to show that to the coach. So uh, the coach has this um, idea, idea that the more you run, the higher the probability of, of winning the quarter. So we use, we use the running data for, for quarter um, average per individual um, and you know if, if the quarter was won or lost or draw so pretty much if it's draw that's lost so again you have a classification problem and then we try to try to predict if if the running performance inside the quarter can predict the quarter outcome and it couldn't so it means that you know if you're running more or less doesn't mean you're gonna win or lose the quarter so we use that to you know as a kind of fact to get some leverage when, when, when we spoke to, uh, to coaches. Because, you know, coaches say, like, if you're winning, it's tactics. If they're losing, it's, it's you because they're not running enough. Yeah. So we use that as a leverage point to showcase that it's, it's actually not the case. So, uh, 
Um, what, what we use GPS, and that's quite interesting, um, uh, you want to use GPS to protect from the downside more than reap the benefits of the upside. So let, let me just clarify that. So uh, we just want to make sure that athletes are hitting certain distances in a week and there's not much oscillations. So uh, if there's a lot of oscillations, um, then you might have a, a, a problem with the downside, in this case injury. So if, if you're increasing too, too much too soon or, or you have a big drop in a week, uh, then the ne next week will be, again, increased. And then you might be at a certain risk of, you know, training load uh, problem. So we use GPS actually live and uh, each athlete needs to hit certain distance, both, you know, total distance and high speed distance. That's individualized based on his, you know, historical stuff. So if, if he hits that, those distances in, inside the, the practice, you know, all fine. But he, if he doesn't hit those distances, then he needs to do extra running. So extra running is, is not a punishment. It, it is not, you know, conditioning. It, it is a form of conditioning, but it's mostly to accumulate certain distance just to make sure that the variation from week to week is not big. So anyway, I'm, I'm off hoping to get to Jumover unit. So uh, the research is going to be on pretty much on reliability of load velocity profiles uh, to check if, if, if they are, I would say, reliable enough to be used in practice. So we're going to compare two push devices and two Jumover devices uh, on repeated measures. So one, and we want to check how much they did differ. So from day to day between the units, and uh, say, in this case, we're going to attach two push devices on a left and, and right forearm and two gym over devices on left and right side of the, on the, of the barbell. And we want to check, you know, how much they differ. So we want to estimate a measurement error. Uh, and then uh, we want to estimate, you know, how, how much the, the brands of devices differ. And then also, uh, when you repeat the measures, you know, day one and day two, we want to we wanna check the typical error, how much certain velocity-based estimates, you know, vary from day to day. And we want to check if that variation or that typical error is, is bigger than that something that could be practically useful. So I'm hoping to publish two or three papers from that, and I'm going to use that for a, for a PhD. So... And this is this has already been done in 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 Spain. Something similar. Um, it's not exactly same protocol. Because we're gonna use two devices and and uh, two devices of each brand. Uh, but say Sp Spanish researchers, they keep sticking to uh, putting all the athletes inside the same bucket and then try to estimate. Uh, you know, percent of one RM from velocity. Uh, but our approach will be more individualized. So we're going to create a um, individualized uh, load velocity profile and then use that for, for the analysis rather than, you know, pulling everyone, everyone in. And there's going to be a lot of, um, it, it, it's, it, it's really fruitful data. It's really rich data because it, it allows a lot of hypotheses to be tested. So I just, I finished initial draft of the proposal, so hopefully we're going to start measuring in January or maybe February. Um, so wish me luck. Yeah, man. That sounds awesome. And I think that the, the things that are really cool with it to me are, you know, obviously the validation is important um, because I think too many people hold too much clout in too many things because they're new or it's trendy or it's sexy or whatever it is. Um, and the reliability obviously is important day to day, but then looking at it on that next day and, and what that could lead to, because I think a lot of people like to use those tools. It's kind of an offshoot of a readiness monitor, but I don't know if people really know if they're doing it right or not. Uh, so I think that's that's rad, man. I think that's really important. I think that because because people are tinkering with it, but I don't. I, that sometimes makes me nervous, because if you let the kids know, and they're just having a bad day, 
it's pretty easy to make 225 look like 405, you know? Um, so how you can actually break it down and look at things that way, I think it's pretty awesome. Yeah, there's a... Um... Uh, I think in the States you use vertical jump, like mm -hmm. actual vertical jump performance, and, and it's been shown that it's not really sensitive to fatigue states. Uh, there's a fantastic papers by Rob, uh, Rob Gutterco. Uh, I think he's from Canada. Uh, I had an interview with him on a complimentary training, and there's a link so, for, for the article. So what he did is he did a uh, first study he did is reliability of certain metrics. So once he showed that certain metrics are reliable, uh, then he proceeded in, in tiring up the athlete. So he measured certain metrics, and then he did like crazy workload, like 100 depth jumps or something like that. And then yeah. the, the next, the ne something like that, yeah. So the next day, he, he estimated uh, those metrics again to see which one is going to drop. And vertical jump actually wasn't really sensitive so the athletes will still reach certain height but what did change is the the way they perform the jump so the kinematics and kinetics changed but for, for that you need to have like a force platform mm -hmm. and you know might be a major pain in the ass to test the athletes uh, you know a few times a week so um, but it's much better than a vertical jump yeah. and, and and as you said people here's the thing that people don't even consider um, so imagine you're my athlete and today I test you and I see that, the, you know, there's a drop and there's probably, according to a model, there's a risk of you getting injured. Should I tell you that? So if I tell you you're going to get injured, there's a likelihood of you getting injured in the next seven days. Man, I just planted a worm in your head. Yeah, it's inception. So, yeah. And then, then you might actually, you know, uh, there's a saying, I think in the States, um, well, basically, though, what you're saying is, like, whether you think you can or you can't, you're probably right. So if you're telling somebody, hey, man, because you just did X, your relationship to have Y happen has gone up Z percent, all of a sudden now, little Johnny's pissing down his leg because he thinks he's going to blow his knee out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or, or, or he has a, or he has a um, I would say, a joker in the hand, we say, like, we had a joker uh for a bad performance inside the game so he has a shitty game performance he's gonna say yeah but but you told me i'm gonna get injured or you told me i dropped my you know power or something so i couldn't play really well so um i i do believe in in radical transparency like i want stuff to be transparent for athletes and coaches but i think i'm 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 becoming a little bit more Machia machiavellian in the last few years uh, because you, you, you want to hide certain information from the athletes. You just don't want to show them everything. Right. Yeah. No, 100%. because it, it, it can backfire. It, it can make things even worse. So. Oh yeah. And, and listen, as soon as you give them an out, they're going to take it. Oh yeah, exactly. So you need to be smart to actually trick them a little bit. You need to be a snake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you do need to be a snake. You know, you, you you cannot be like radically transparent and just naive. No. So uh, we had one discussion to have this semaphore lights, uh, where we we as a as a as a group of coaches and and med medical staff, we decide who's you know red, green, yellow. So red is you know at risk. Yellow is you know probably needs some modification or training, and green is good. So, we, you know, a few coaches said, like, we, we need to... Sh I actually asked, should, are we going to show this to athletes? Is this going to be visible to athletes? And I said, yeah. I said, yeah, but imagine you come to a practice and then you see I'm red. What, why, why the hell am I red? What's going to happen? You just create, like, a inception, <laughs> as you said, in the athlete's head. So sometimes you need to, you need to withhold the information. Oh, yeah. Uh, withhold the information with the aim of making things better, not we hold information with the aim of making things worse, if that makes sense. 100%. Yeah, dude. I think that's, that's fantastic because you can you just feed them what, what's going to help them and don't feed them what's going to hinder them, I think is, is really important. And Mladen, I think this is absolutely a killer talk, man. I, I can't thank you enough for spending the time with us today. And 
Enjoy stoked well, we could bro. finally catch up, bro. This is awesome. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for inviting me, and um, glad I, I finally, finally synced. And yeah. we, we get this done. Yeah, man. Well, appreciate it. This will be up real soon, brother. People are going to love it. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Jay. Yeah. And uh, good luck with your work, man. Thanks, brother. You the same. And a huge thank you to Milad and Jovanovic for spending some time with us today and, and just sharing, man. Awesome stuff. Killer stuff. Can't wait to see what his research brings to us. And, and guys, you know, somebody who's literally been around the world and seen it from Five different angles sharing how different people work, you know, in sport around the world. Just priceless stuff. I can't thank Milan enough for being so open and honest and candid in the sharing today. And as always, guys, if you did enjoy it, please share it through the social media outlet of your choice. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever it may be. If you like this talk, guys, and you know somebody that it could benefit, please shoot them a DM with a link to it. Email them a link to it. Tweet it at them. Instagram post. Tag them on it. We're just trying to get the best information we can find out there to all the great coaches. And as always, guys, thank you for everything that you do for us here at Central Virginia Sport Performance. We will be back next week with another awesome guest. We will see you then.